All right, so here we are once again in our class, Leviticus for Beginners, Training for Holiness. This is lesson number three, and the title of this lesson is Attaining Holiness. Um, and the discussion uh, that we'll have today is about the, um, the burnt offering, Leviticus chapter one, verses one to 17. So if you remember our first lesson, you will note that uh, we'll be following the outline for Leviticus produced by uh, Dr. Roper in his uh, commentary. And it's simple to follow, it's well organized. Let me get that one up for you, there it is. Uh, just two main ideas, two main points, attaining holiness, you know, chapters one to 16, and practicing holiness, verses 17 to 27, and then you have the breakdown in each section. So in the attaining holiness section, attaining holiness through offerings, through consecrated, a consecrated priesthood, attaining holiness by distinguishing between clean and unclean, and by observing the day of atonement. Then the second part, the breakdown is practicing holiness, by individual responsibility to keep God's moral and ritual laws. Um, uh, the priestly responsibilities in practicing holiness, the nation's responsibility to promote holiness, those would be the festivals. We're going to talk about the festivals. Uh, number D, uh, practicing holiness, the reasons for practicing holiness, and of course the reasons are the blessings and the curses attached uh, to the practice of holiness. And then the final one, evidence of holiness, the vows, taking of vows and valuations. So each of these headings have subdivisions, but as I say, if you're following the outline, um, uh, if you stay focused on the outline, you'll know exactly where we're at and the context of each subject. And believe me, that'll be important when we kind of go deeper into the weeds here uh, with the details of these things. Um, Exodus, the previous book in the Pentateuch, Exodus was mainly a narrative about Moses leading the Israelites out of slavery into freedom and into a covenant with, uh, with God. Leviticus, the book we are now studying, is a book of instruction explaining in detail how the Israelites would become holy people how they would become a holy nation, uh, and that would be by obeying God's laws concerning worship, and how to maintain holiness, and that would be uh, through personal conduct and keeping God's laws concerning ritual and religious responsibilities. Again, it's worth repeating, their entire lives were affected by their status as God's holy nation. There was no compartmentalization. You know, there wasn't like a compartment here. Uh, this is my Sabbath day. Uh, this is the day I go to the tabernacle or you know, uh, every other week I go and offer a sacrifice, that's that. And then I have my private and personal life. Uh-uh. Uh, everything uh, was regulated by God's laws and ordinances, both the private life and the public life, uh, the personal life, and the worship life, everything was a unit uh, that was um, uh, advised or informed by uh, God's, uh, God's laws and their personal uh, responsibility. Their religion affected every part of life, as does our religion. That shouldn't be a, a huge surprise. A point that, was readily, uh, that we readily see as we study their lives but we're not always so quick to acknowledge. You know, we think, wow, look at the Jews, you know, God, God's laws and God's word affected every part of their lives. Imagine that. Well, it's the same thing today. God's laws, God's rules, God's provisions continue to affect every part of our lives as well. Not only the Sunday worship, but our lives Monday through Saturday. Okay, so let's begin talking about attaining holiness through offerings. In uh, Exodus, uh, there's, a, there's a graphic here uh, of the uh, tabernacle complex, all right? You see the courtyard and the, the uh, bronze altar and the, the laver, and then of course the, uh, the covered portion, the holy uh, place and the holy of holies. So you have the tabernacle and the, uh, 
the courtyard where the sacrifices, where the offerings were made uh, by the priest. So in Exodus, we read about the building of this tabernacle complex and the fabrication of the furnishings that the priests would use and the garments that they would wear in carrying out their duties in the sacrificial system, which was to be the central feature of the Israelites' uh, religion. And also the manner by which they were to become and maintain uh, their holy status before God. And that was through the practice of the sacrificial system. Now, offering sacrifices, this was not a new thing. You know, when the, when the tabernacle was, uh, was put together and the, and the rules for the sacrificing of animals and given by God, this was like not a new thing that uh, no one had ever heard of before. I mean, offering sacrifices uh, uh, to interact with God was as old as Cain and Abel, who each sacrificed to God an animal and produce as offerings. We see, for example, the patriarchs build altars or pillars and offer animals and oil to God uh, as praise and as thanksgiving. Noah, for example, one of the first things he did when he came out of the boat was to build an, offer, uh, build an altar and, 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 and offer sacrifice. Uh, Abram offered sacrifice. O Isaac offered sacrifice. Jacob uh, uh, built altars and, and offered sacrifice. What was new here, all right, what was new here was that God now mandated that these offerings and these sacrifices that were to be made at the tabernacle and they were to be mediated by the priests appointed by God in the manner commanded by God for the reasons given by God. Before everybody was offering sacrifices on a hill, in a valley, you know, on an altar, uh, whatever. With the building of the tabernacle, all of this religious activity, as far as the Jews were concerned, was now to be centered at the tabernacle. It was to be offered by the priests. There was to be a manner uh, and a way of doing things and reasons for the doing of these things. So all the sacrificial system that was done independently before was now to be concentrated at the uh, tabernacle. And so in chapter 20 of the 27 chapters of Leviticus, the chapter begins with the words that say, now the Lord spoke to Moses. And so the first seven chapters deal with the laws pertaining to the five of the offerings to be made at the tabernacle. Uh, it says in Leviticus uh, chapter one, verses one and two, then the Lord called to Moses and spoke to him from the tent of meeting saying, speak to the sons of Israel and say to them, when any man of you brings an offering to the Lord, you shall bring your offering of animals from the herd or the flock. And so this section will be about the burnt offering. Okay? As I said, there were five kinds of offerings. Let me kind of put those up there. There were burnt offerings, and that's what we'll be talking about today. There were grain offerings, peace offerings, sin offerings, and guilt offerings. And these offerings are talked about in uh, the first uh, five, six chapters of, um, of Leviticus. And then the same you know, five uh, offering types are spoken of once again, this time in later chapters, in chapters seven and six and seven. And so what happens is God repeats the explanation of these, uh, of these sacrifices. And I'll explain why. As I said, let me see, let me get the thing there. There you go. Uh, so in Leviticus chapter one, uh, verses one to 17, um, there are two sets of instructions for each of the five offerings, and it seems repetitious. However, the first section, uh, for example, about the, ver uh, the burnt offerings, is the ritual requirement described from the standpoint of one making the offering. In other words, the first, set of instructions is for the offerer, the, the, the Israelite who comes to the uh, tabernacle to make a burnt offering. And then the second section where you know, all of the offerings are repeated over again, 
um, describe the same sacrifice, but this time from the priest's perspective and how he was to deal with this offering. So chapters one to six describes the five basic sacrifices from the Israelites' perspective, and chapters six and seven from the priest's perspective. Now, of course, there's an overlap in each, but this is how the material is divided uh, in chapters one to uh, seven um, at the beginning of the book of uh, Leviticus. And so we need to understand the book of Leviticus was considered a manual for the work of the priest and the high priest, since it contained exact instructions for the priests to follow in their work of the tabernacle. However, it also provided valuable information for the individual Israelite in giving him the reasons and the manner to present his sacrifice to the priests. So God's providing information concerning sacrifices, which are now going to be offered only at the tabernacle. He provides information to the offerer, which would be the individual Israelite, as well as to the priest who would be actually making the sacrifice, leaving nothing to chance. So let's review the five basic offerings, looking first at the initial offering brought to the priest at the tabernacle, and then examine the priestly responsibility for that particular offering. So we're going to start with the burnt offering. The burnt offering um, would be from the uh, herd or the cattle, and it is uh, found in Leviticus chapter 1 verses 3 to 9. So we read, if his offering is a burnt offering, his meaning one of the Israelites, um, if his offering is a burnt offering from the herd, he shall offer it, a male without defect, he shall offer it at the doorway of the tent of meeting, that he may be accepted before the Lord. He shall lay his hand on the head of the burnt offering, that it may be accepted for him to make atonement on his behalf. He shall slay the young bull before the Lord, and Aaron's sons the priests shall offer up the blood and sprinkle the blood around the altar that is at the doorway of the tent of meeting. He shall then skin the burnt offering and cut it into pieces. The sons of Aaron and the priest shall put fire on the altar and arrange wood on the fire. Then Aaron's sons, the priests, shall arrange the pieces, the head and the sweat over the wood, which is on uh, the fire that is on the altar. Its entrails, however, and its legs he shall wash with water, and the priest shall offer up in smoke all of it on the altar for a burnt offering, an offering by fire of a soothing aroma uh, to the Lord. All right, so the burnt offering, first of all, it is a voluntary offering because it says if someone makes this offering. It's a voluntary offering. It was to be consumed by fire and it ascended, you know, the smoke ascended to the Lord. Uh, the idea was that the sacrifice was to be pleasing to God. Now, the one uh, bringing the sacrifice had seven steps to follow. We, we often think about the priest all the time, uh, but we don't realize that the one making the offering also had uh, a hand in the process of offering an animal to God. So first of all, he had to select a male animal. It says from the herd, so that would be cattle, and it specifies here a bull. So he had to select a male without defect, and then he, when he brought it to the entrance of the uh, tabernacle, uh, he would, uh, he would uh, lay his hand uh, on uh, the uh, animal's head. Secondly, he would present the animal to the priest and the priest would uh, inspect the animal you know, to make sure that it was uh, without a defect. The third uh, thing that would happen, I was a little uh, hasty there, the third thing that was happening was at this point, the offerer would lay hands on the, uh, on the animal itself. Uh, this signified, first of all, that the animal was accepted. Uh, secondly, that it was acceptable uh, as a sacrifice to make atonement. Thirdly, him putting his hands on the animal symbolized a transfer of sin from the offerer to the animal. The sin goes from the offerer by laying hands, 
he transfers the sins to the animals. And then there was the slaughter of the animal uh, in order to make atonement with God for sin. All right, number four, the Israelite would himself kill the animal before the Lord, probably in a special ritualistic manner. He would do this inside the tabernacle complex near the altar of burnt offering. So it wasn't the priest that killed the animal, it was the Israelite that killed the, the animal. Next step, the priest were to take some of the blood and sprinkle that blood from the dead animal on the altar of burnt offering. Number six, the one who brought the offering had to skin the animal and cut it into pieces. In other words, he had to skin it and butcher it. Okay? Um, uh, let's see. And so killing and skimming and butchering the animal uh, to be sacrificed was the responsibility of the worshiper. The seventh step. The seventh step was for the priest to actually make the sacrifice since they, the priests alone, were authorized to put offerings on the burnt altar. They had to keep the fire going 24 seven, every day, seven days a week, 24 hours a day, the fire on the burnt offering uh, had to be lit. And they had to clean the various parts of the animal before putting it up on the altar. Now when the sacrifice was done correctly, this sacrifice produced as the Bible says, a soothing aroma pleasing to the Lord. This is language that is anthropomorphic. In other words, uh, attributing human qualities to God. It's not as if God has a nose and the smoke is rising up to heaven where God actually smelled, you know. It was a way of saying that the sacrifice was pleasing to God. Uh, and acceptable, that was the important part. It was pleasing and it was acceptable to him for the purpose uh, for which it was, uh, it was done. Now in chapter six, verses eight to 13, the same sacrifice is referred to, but this time it is referred to from the priest's perspective. So this time let's go to uh, Leviticus chapter six and let's read what uh, Leviticus chapter six says concerning the priest's responsibility. Then the Lord spoke to Moses saying, command Aaron and his son saying, this is the law for the burnt offering. The burnt offering itself shall remain on the hearth, on the altar all night until morning, and the fire on the altar is to be kept burning on it. The priest is to put on his linen robe and he shall put on undergarments next to his flesh. And he shall take up the ashes to which the fire reduces the burnt offering on the altar and place them beside the altar. Then he shall take off his garments and put on other garments and carry the ashes outside the camp to a clean place. The fire on the altar shall be kept burning on it. It shall not go out but the priest shall burn wood on it every morning and he shall lay out the burnt offering on it and offer up in smoke the fat portions of the peace offering on it. Fire shall be kept burning continually on the altar. It is not to go out. So I want you to note that before in Leviticus 1, God said to Moses, speak to the sons of Israel. And this was in giving instructions to the people about burnt offerings. In chapter six, what we've just read here, the Lord directs his instructions to Aaron and his sons, speaking about the very same burnt offering, but this time outlining the priestly responsibilities in offering this uh, sacrifice. And so in verses nine to 11, the instructions deal mainly with the removal of the sacrifice from the altar. The sacrifice was to be left all night until it was reduced completely to ashes. The ashes were regarded as holy, so they were not treated as refuse or trash, uh, but rather handled in a way befitting a holy object. Uh, remember I, I mentioned before, you know, what, what becomes holy, whatever God says is holy becomes holy. Well, the sacrifice is holy. It's holy when it's put on the altar, and even when it's burnt down to just ashes, it still remains holy and has to be treated 
in a respectful, uh, in a respectful manner. And so the priest wore a special linen robe when he removed the ashes. Once removed from the altar, the priest would change back into his regular clothes and carry the ashes to a ceremonially clean place, meaning a place where no dead body or no carcass of an animal uh, had been uh, found before. Ceremonially clean meant a place where, as I say, no dead body or no animal had been uh, before. Uh, that was uh, to the point uh, that uh, the sacrifice itself was considered uh, holy. In verses 12 and 13, we also learn from these instructions that the fire of the altar should not go out. So keeping the fire continually lit was another duty of the priests. Uh, 24 hours a day, seven days a week, the fire on the altar continued to burn. All right. Let's take a look at the burnt offerings, uh, this time from the flock. Remember the first explanation is uh, if you select an animal from the herd, well the herd would be a cattle, would be a bull in this, in this case. Now uh, perhaps someone comes to make a burnt offering, but the animal is not from the herd, it's from the flock. So the instructions for a burnt offering from the flock, a sheep or a goat for example, were similar for the one offering the sacrifice uh, for, the, uh, for, uh, for a bull. In other words, the same seven steps were taken by the one who was offering. And uh, the priest who placed the animal on the altar uh, uh, did the same thing. Uh, when, when the animal was completely burnt up and there were only ashes uh, remaining, he would change, he would take the ashes off, he would change again, he'd bring the ashes to a clean place. So basically the procedure for the Israelite and the priest in making a burnt offering, whether it was uh, cattle or sheep or goats, were uh, exactly the same. And the result was the same. It was a sacrifice that was pleasing to God. Then we have another type of burnt offering, and this time uh, an offering of birds. So let's read about that in Leviticus 1. It says, but if his offering to the Lord is a burnt offering of birds, then he shall bring his offering from the turtle doves or from young pigeons. The priest shall bring it to the altar and wring off its head and offer it up in smoke on the altar, and its blood is to be drained out on the side of the uh, altar. He shall also take away its crop with its feathers and cast it beside the altar eastward to the place of the ashes. Then he shall tear it by its wings, but shall not sever it. And the priest shall offer it up in smoke on the altar on the wood, which is on the fire. It is a burnt offering, an offering by fire of a soothing aroma to the Lord. I want you to note that the priest does all the work here in offering a bird as a burnt offering. He breaks its neck, he pours the blood on the side of the altar, he removes its feather and crop. The crop is the pouch in the throat where the bird stores its food. It tears its wings without splitting its crop. He kind of opens it up without without breaking it apart. And then he puts it on the altar and burns it and, it, and he leaves it on the altar to burn to the point where it becomes, uh, uh, it becomes uh, ashes. Um, birds were allowed as a burnt offering so that even the poor who could only afford a single bird could still offer this type of sacrifice as a sin offering. Only turtle doves or young pigeons were acceptable since most birds were considered unclean. Leviticus chapter six, uh, you know, the part where it explains you know, the priest's role. So uh, Leviticus chapter six only adds that the ashes of these sacrifices were to be disposed of in a clean area outside the camp. Unlike other types of sacrifices, the priests derived no benefit from burnt offerings since the entire animal was destroyed by fire. Only the hides which had been skinned for the offering uh, were, were left. All right, so let's talk, so that's how, that's how they did it. 
You know, we said there are five different types of offerings. The first type is the burnt offering. And this is the way that they did it for, for cattle, for sheep, for birds. The role of the offerer, the Israelite, and the, um, the role of the priests. So let's talk about the significance, the meaning of this. There were five different kinds of offerings. One could, and at times were obliged to make with each having their own significance and purpose. The burnt offering signified total surrender. Since the animal was completely destroyed down to ashes, except for the skin or the hide, which was kept by the priest. The idea of the burnt offering was that there was no redeeming price to save a potential profit from future use or sale. Uh, as it was in other offering, the peace offering, for example, you, you could go and, and bring a bull that you were going to sacrifice and then instead of actually butchering it and you know, putting it on the altar, you would, give, you would offer money in order to redeem the animal. So uh, by giving the money, you were redeeming the animal. It was still an offering to God, but you, you kept the animal and had use of the animal for work, or for food, or if you sold it, you know, you, you'd get some money for it. When it came to a burnt offering, however, you had to offer the animal. You, you couldn't redeem it with money. And like some other sacrifices where you could put the animal up and the priest got a portion of it you know, for his share, and even the offer uh, of the animal, you know, he got a portion of it too. When it came to a burnt offering, no one profited by it. The entire animal was offered up uh, to the Lord. No, no redeeming price to save potential future profit. No food left for use by the priest or the one offering the sacrifice. So it represented total surrender. Secondly, burnt offering resulted in atonement for sin for the worshiper as well as a sacrifice pleasing to God. So not only were you offering a sacrifice pleasing to God, you were also offering a sacrifice for your sins uh, for, that they may be atoned for, paid for. Thirdly, the burnt offering was a, a vision of God's call for believers to offer themselves completely to God. I mean, you couldn't put yourself up on the altar you know, well, you could, but you know, that would be one way of offering yourself completely. Well, the, the burnt offering was symbolically a way of making a complete offering of yourself uh, to God, all right? And, and we have this vision of God's call for believers to offer themselves completely to God through the burnt offering in the Old Testament. And in the New Testament, we have the same called by God, right? In, Ramon, in, Ramon, in Romans chapter 12, verses one and two, Paul talks about offering ourselves, right? As living sacrifices, the same idea. God is wanting us to offer ourselves completely uh, to Him. And He offers us various ways that we can do that. And then the burnt offering uh, was also a required sacrifice in various instances. For example, it was a free will offering. In other words, I, I want to give God something because I'm rejoicing. So I, I offer a burnt offering. You know, I, I completely offer the sacrifice to God. Uh, or it was offered when someone was fulfilling a vow. Uh, and that type of sacrifice was called a votive offering. It meant you were fulfilling a vow of some kind. We read about that in Leviticus 22. And then burnt offerings were also the type of offerings that were made every morning and every evening uh, by the priests as part of the rituals that were going on in the tabernacle area. So morning and evening they offered burnt sacrifices. They also offered a burnt sacrifice on the Sabbath day. Uh, they offered burnt sacrifices 
uh, for monthly celebrations or yearly feasts, which we will study in the future, and also when there was a special request uh, from God. And we read about those in Numbers uh, 28 and 1 Samuel 13, 2 Samuel 24, Psalm 66, uh, various times when God would require a burnt offering. And so the whole burnt offering was the most common and repeated sacrifice among the five sacrifices uh, that are mentioned. Uh, I want to make a relationship at this point between the burnt offering and uh, Jesus. Each sacrifice described in Leviticus has three elements. First, there's the offerer, that's the Israelite. Second, the priest, he's the mediator appointed by God to make the offerings. And thirdly, there's the offering itself. Animals, produce, oil, wine, grain, bread. When we, when we look at a comparison uh, to Christ, we see that Christ fulfills all three roles on our behalf, the offerer, the priest, and the offering. He is, first of all, the offerer. He came uh, as a man to do God's will. He stood under the same law as an Israelite man did and had to fulfill it, and yet he was without sin. When we say he fulfilled the law, it means all the requirements of the law, you know, thou shalt not kill, thou shalt not steal, you know, all, the, all the moral uh, and ethical requirements of the law, he fulfilled. He didn't steal, he didn't kill, he didn't lust in his heart, he, he didn't do any of those things. He responded to uh, uh, temptations or tests uh, in, in a positive way, in an obedient uh, way. So he lived his life uh, without any, uh, any sin. As the offerer of a sacrifice, he was the perfect offerer, he had no sin. Secondly, he is the priest at the same time. Uh, he is the priest appointed by God. Not only a priest, but a special high priest, not limited by sin and death, as were the Jewish priests. We read about that in Hebrews uh, chapter seven. It says, the former priests, on the one hand, existed in greater numbers because they were prevented by death from continuing. But Jesus, on the other hand, because he continues forever, holds his priesthood permanently. Therefore, he is able also to save forever those who draw near to God through him, since he always lives to make intercession for them. And so he is a priest appointed by God and he is a, an eternal priest. He doesn't have to be replaced every generation. And then thirdly, he's the offering. The sacrificial system was a teaching preview of Christ's vicarious atonement. An animal, for example, an animal without defect, which would be sinless, is killed in order to make up for a person's sins. And as I mentioned before, when I was talking about the procedure, sins are symbolically transferred from the offerer to the animal by the laying on of hands, right? Uh, he'd bring the animal, the priest would inspect it, no defects, he'd lay his hands on it. That was a, that was a symbolic way of transferring his sins to the uh, to the animal. And then the sins are then transferred to God's justice and thus satisfying God's justice through the death of the animal. You see, death is the, is the portal, if you wish, of transferring something from the physical realm to the spiritual realm. And so the sins of the offerer are placed uh, on the animal and when the animal is killed, the sins go from this physical realm to the spiritual realm, into God's realm for disposition, for forgiveness. The process repeated over and over because men continually sinned and the offering of animals only symbolized what was to come since their death 
uh, could not in reality atone for the sins of men, could not in reality satisfy God's laws and justice. This was a preview. This was a preview teaching the process in which God was going to use to deal with the sins of men forever. Okay? And so we read in Hebrews uh, chapter 10, uh, verses three to seven, but in those sacrifices, there is a reminder of sins year by year, for it is impossible for the blood of bulls and goats to take away sins. Therefore, when he comes into the world, he says, sacrifice and offering you have not desired, but a body you have prepared for me. In whole burnt offerings and sacrifices for sin, you have taken no pleasure. Then I said, behold, I have come. In the scroll of the book is it, it is written of me to do your will, O God. And so they were the type, meaning the Jews and the sacrificial system, they were the type preparing and pointing to the antitype, which was the real thing, not just a preview or a shadow of things to come. And so Christ's sacrifice is better, is complete for various reasons. First of all, both the offerer and the offering are perfect, are without sin, and thus require no additional sacrifices. It says in Hebrews 10, 12, but he having offered one sacrifice for sins for all time, sat down at the right hand of God because the offerer is perfect and the uh, offering is perfect. There's no need to repeat it over and over again. Secondly, the priest is the God man, Jesus, who represents humanity because as a human, he suffered and died as humans do. That's what Isaiah 53 uh, verse three and following uh, are all about. And Hebrews chapter four, verse 15. The priest is, is, is not just a man, but he is a, a man who has a divine uh, nature. And, and so therefore uh, his, his uh, uh, work on our behalf is done only once and does not have to be repeated over and over again because he lives and continues to live. And the work that he has done continues to exist throughout eternity. Thirdly, the high priest, Jesus, enters the heavenly holy place to offer the sacrifice, the blood of his life, thus actually making the atonement that fulfills the law resulting in forgiveness. This was something that the offering of animals and the blood of animals in the Holy of Holies in the temple by a human priest could only symbolize, but not actually accomplish. We read in Hebrews 9 verse 24, for Christ did not enter a holy place made with hands. See, that's a reference to the tabernacle or to the temple. A mere copy of the true one the true temple, the true sacrificial place, but into heaven itself, now to appear in the presence of God for us. And then number four, the priest and the offering are divine. Because the offerer, the priest, and the sacrifice were all divine, were all eternal in nature, Hebrews 10, 11 to 18, it means that all persons and all sins are forgiven for all time. You see, once a person believes in Jesus as the Son of God and expresses that faith through repentance and baptism, we read about that in Acts chapter 2, verse 38, that person appropriates Christ's sacrifice as his own. It's as if the sacrifice that Christ makes is offered specifically for that person. You ever wonder what this means here? He says, therefore, everyone who confesses me before men, I will also confess him before my Father who is in heaven. You ever wonder what that, what that meant? This is in relationship to what Christ does for us in heaven. 
Every person who confesses his name on earth, Christ is in heaven offering the blood of the sacrifice on behalf of that person is in effect confessing his name so that his sins can be forgiven once and for all. This is the beauty of this passage. This is the magnificence of the plan of salvation as it is uh, previewed in the book of Leviticus. Did the people, you know, the Jews, did they understand all of this? Well, no, of course not. It, it, not all of this had been revealed, but they did understand that obeying God's laws and procedures uh, removed their sins and gave them a sense of forgiveness for that time. We now know how sins are forgiven forever in our generation because we have access to the gospel and we understand who and know who the Messiah truly is. All right, well, we're going to stop right there for this time. Uh, Jesus is in heaven, says this sacrifice is for your name. And when I put your name in that slide, I meant your name. When Jesus is in heaven and you're here confessing his name, repenting of your sins and being baptized, he's saying this sacrifice is for John, is for Mary, is for Bill, is for Joe. Every time someone goes down into the water, Jesus is confessing their name and offering his blood to remove their sins. Okay, well, that's the lesson for this time. I encourage you to always continue reading. If you finish reading Leviticus, go back and read it over again. Uh, it'll, it'll, help, uh, uh, it'll help you understand the lessons as we go through them at a, at a pretty rapid pace. Well, that's it for this time. We'll see you next time uh, for our lessons in Leviticus for beginners. Bye-bye for now.